but this was way back before the initial demonstrations also began in Syria. And uh, we'll, we'll come to Syria in that context. Yeah. As far as Syria is concerned, undoubtedly, it is, uh, it was, because now certain changes are coming to the constitution where the Ba'ath party cannot monopolize power anymore. It was essentially a one-party system where smaller parties would be there, the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, and so on and so forth. But essentially, the Ba'ath Socialist Party controlled the Syrian state, but they had roots amongst the people. But yet, it was uh, quite a repressive state. I've met friends in Syria who became friends later, who were part of the initial demonstrations in Dara, because the, the, de the demonstrations didn't begin in the south of Syria. Those very people who were part of the demonstration said, yes, yes, we want the rights that you have in India, the right to protest, the right to dissent, the free media, and the other things that go in, into a liberal progressive constitution. We don't have that right now. But we don't want foreign mercenaries. We don't want this country to be converted into an Islamic state. We want a secular Syria. That was what Muslim friends in Syria were telling me. Of course, the minorities don't want an Islamic state. But there were friends from the majority Sunni community who said that we did not bargain for this kind of a scenario where we have mercenaries from the world pouring into a country and the role that Qatar and uh, Kuwait and Saudi and Turkey are playing in terms of uh, destroying our, uh, our culture and our civilization. Oops, okay. Now the point is that in Syria, one is the Syrian army and the other is the police called the Mukbarat. The police always the more repressive force. So when the initial demonstration did take place, the police did hit upon the people. At the same time, from my, our own understanding and speaking to friends in various parts of the Arab world, that Assad at the same time understood that the need for reform had come that they could not suppress the entire uh, upsurge of the people and that reforms were necessary. In 2011 itself, they sat down with the parliamentary opposition and they went towards reforming the constitution. They went through a process of a one-year reform of the constitution, which was finally put to referendum in 2012. In 2012, 56% of the people came out to vote, even in this kind of a scenario. That constitution has some problems because the problem with most Muslim countries, uh, especially in that part of the world, is that the constitution says that the prime minister or the president of the country can only be a Muslim. So Syria being a secular country, but because of the pressure of the Islamists, especially of the Muslim Brotherhood, the constitution still says that the top post of this country can only be a Muslim. And actually it goes on to say Sunni Muslim. That is how, uh, you know, the, the problems of uh, political Islam manifesting themselves in the constitutions of the region where equal rights are not, uh, uh, not given to the, the minorities. So from 2012, you had this scenario. The referendum took place. 56% of the people voted, but not a line in any newspaper of the world. In Yemen, you had an election with only one person standing, and it was declared a democratic election. In Ukraine, half the country was at war. They had an election that was a successful election. But in Syria, you had a referendum and an election in 2014. And in that election of 2014, 25 from across the world were there. We traveled to cities under siege and under war. And yet, 73% of the people voted. And 88% people voted for Assad because uh, as of now, he's a unifying force. Uh, Kerry and Obama and the Saudis and all keep on saying that Assad must go. But finally, it is for the people of Syria to decide who has to stay and who has to go. Okay. And then came out this entire thing of moderate rebels and extremist rebels, ISIS. And in fact, Al-Qaeda was called moderate compared to ISIS. The Free Syrian Army was supposed to be the moderate force. So what is this Free Syrian Army? The Free Syrian Army is the conduit for the supply of weapons to the Jabhat al-Nusra, the Al-Qaeda. The Jabhat al-Nusra is the Al-Qaeda of Syria. Officially, they call themselves that. But the CNN, the BBC, the Al Jazeera, or even our papers anymore, do not refer to the Jabhat al-Nusra al-Qaeda as a terrorist organization. We've also started calling ISIS as militants now. That is the way they're trying to change the, you know, the, the language around these organizations. So the Americans this time did not create their own organization because they know that 
again it will go into some other direction. But they use the free Syrian army as the conduit for the supply of weapons, chemical weapons or what have you. And that is why what they've done is that the kind of, uh, you know, the network that they built up post-1979 in the aftermath of the Afghan Jihad, they've carried on to build up that network across the world. Mercenaries, militants, jihadists from more than 100 countries are active in Syria. 80% of those fighting in Syria are foreigners. 20% are Syrian. Though in Iraq it's a different situation, we'll discuss Iraq, but because, you know, uh, the Syrian situation in Syria after the Russian intervention, a lot of things have become to change and uh, the tide is turning in our favor. The global tide. This is General McCurney on TV saying that we helped build ISIS. Now coming to Mr. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the Khalifa of the world, where did he come from? Okay. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was basically Al-Qaeda in Iraq imprisoned by the Americans in the Bukha prison of Iraq. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And finally in 2013 and 14, ISIS was created around Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. So the entire team of ISIS was in the American Bukha prison in Iraq. This team was created and then let out through which ISIS was created in Iraq but with a combination of two forces, one was the Salafi Wahhabists linked to Saudi Arabia and then the Baathists. So the Baathists who hated Saudis, finally you had this alliance. So you have ISIS in which you have Baathist elements, but they are the weaker elements, though the, uh, because they are the remnants of the Saddam army, so they are better fighters. But at the same time, ideologically, the Baathists are still secular and the Wahhabi Salafi elements want to create an Islamic state where no Kafirs are supposed to be living there or if they are living then as third grade, third grade citizens. Now you have this statement by the Israeli ambassador to, the, to America, Michael Oren, and there's one important writer called Robert Perry. You all should read him, he's good. In there, Michael Oren clearly states that we should use the Al-Qaeda in Syria to basically weaken the Syrian government, work at regime change, and ensure that Hezbollah is destroyed. And to that extent, that support the ISIS and the Al-Qaeda to go into Lebanon as well, so that you can destroy the resistance in the region. That's Michael Oren. I've got a lot of uh, you know, sources from what appeared in the New York Times, from PBS, from CBS, from various, from the Haaretz, from the Independent, the Guardian, where they clearly articulated as to what was happening. Like, for example, way back in 2014, they speak of the training of all these forces in the bases in Qatar. Then, the ISIS, the Jabal al-Nusra, the Free Syrian Army, actually working in, in what is called the Golan Heights, the Golan Heights are Syrian occupied territory, I mean, it is Syrian territory occupied by the Israelis and it is from the Golan Heights where the Israelis are providing protection, hospitals, weapon supply to these forces. One very important role is the role of Senator John McCain and he's not a small fry, uh, one of the main faces of the Republican Party, he fought against Obama in 2008. Senator Obama, uh, so, uh, Senator John McCain has played a very disruptive role in Ukraine, to Libya, to Syria, all, he's all over the place. And prior to the, yeah, okay, this is a photograph of, this is a photograph of John McCain and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, this one 2013, at that time there was already a $10 million uh, prize on Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi because he was Al-Qaeda. And then you have Bel Haj, the leader of the Al Qaeda in Libya, posing with John McCain. This is how all openly it is being done. Okay. And we came across a new word in these in these last few years. It's called non-lethal aid. Now, what is the non-lethal aid? 
non lethal aid means humvees and toyota pickup trucks being supplied to these the, uh, these characters this is called non lethal aid 250 million dollars around send it uh, the the went ahead non lethal aid okay now this is the leader of the free syrian army general okeli abubakar baghdadi this is john mccain in syria in the north in idlib he goes in from turkey goes to the north in idlib meets all these guys and uh, he guarantees them uh, supplies of weapons and all the other equipment that they required now look at these uh, the information that we can garner from the new york times on 12 Three and a half months before the administration first around non-lethal aid to the opposition, a secret CIA-assisted airlift of arms to the rebels began by March 2013. Would comprise 160 flights and estimated 3,500 tons of military equipment. The CIA helped Arab governments to shop for weapons and vetted rebel commanders, groups to determine who would receive the weapons. God knows who they were vetting because there is no one worth vetting out there. Vetting means that they will be looking at who's the moderate rebel and who's the the good guys and the bad guys. But where are the you know? Yeah. Now, again, this the New York Times reports that Turkey was helping the American allies in the region, which supplied Syrian rebel groups with automatic rifles, propelled grenades, ammunition, anti-tank weapons, and. the syrian muslim brotherhood was playing a very key role and was being paid for by turkey saudi arabia and qatar so you have a lot of information from western media sources in that period itself i've done israel links twice is okay the other problem was the kind of the way the isis and all these forces were actually behaving with the ethnic and religious minorities for example the ancient assyrian christian community of iraq has been reduced from 1.2 million to about 300000 they are just fleeing they are either fleeing towards lebanon or they are fleeing towards europe with the yazidis that are 500000 which we know that community has been brutalized and large parts of the women have been taken into sexual slavery they were also given the option of converting to islam and it was not that please convert to islam you have to convert to islam or you will be beheaded you will be killed or you will be raped or you will be what will be done to you okay so the problem was that this new kind of salafist wahhabi islam or also the takfiri form of islam takfir basically means that i am the only muslim the rest of you are not muslims all of you all are kafirs and i have to either get you back to the faith or you are dead so the initial smss that rotated in syria said that christians to beirut and alawites to the grave that was what was being done because after the libyan victory they thought it was a matter of 3 months in which they could wrap up the lebanese uh, the syrian uh, you know uh, like they could have taken syria within a few months so you had people being crucified people being tortured and the other problem which we uh, which we will discuss but a lot of it was being done on the basis of hadith that were being quoted by them that what we are doing was was done and we are, we are doing what we are islamic teachings have told us to do so there's a you know that is the point that is the point nurubai that this entire battle now the crisis of islam is that there are so many hadith purists and the right hadith that we need to stand up and say which is the right and which is the wrong True, 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 true. No, no. I agree with you, Nuru Bai. The problem is that they are basing their acts on the hadith or on the Quran. That has become the bigger problem. And there are a large section of Muslims who don't see the difference between the Quran and the hadith anymore. They are, they, they think it's on par. Okay. <coughs> okay. Now, I'd like you all to note one thing. There is a very important documentary that was made by Serena Shim. a lebanese american journalist it's a 20 minute documentary on the operations of the isis and the al qaeda from turkey into syria it's a 20 minute documentary why it's important because she was murdered by turkish intelligence in 
She paid for it with her life, but this document is very important. We don't have time to show it today, but uh, it's, uh, we'll send it to you all as part of... No, no, Serena Shame. Just dial Serena, you know, you'll get it. And what does she say in the documentary? And I've seen it. Openly, trucks are operating on the Turkish-Syrian border. Rows and rows of kilometers of trucks getting in weapons, food, oil, gas, logistics for the uh, mercenaries, militants, terrorists, what do you want to call them? It's operating from the Hatay province in southern Turkey. The Incirlik NATO base. Incirlik is the air base where the Americans operate from. So the weapons fly into the Incirlik base and the, the weapons are coming from Lib Libya and NATO base in Europe. And the weapons are carried into the camps in Rihani, Rihaniye and Chokoli, uh, Turkish friends who know where they are. And they were to be distributed and the money and the weapons is being controlled by the CI and the Mossad agents in these camps, not by the Free Syrian Army. So you have Scott Reichard, who is ex-CIA, I have seen his interview, and he says very clearly that it is not the Free Syrian Army that controls the weapons and the, and the money. The training and everything has been done by CI and Mossad agents in these camps. Now this is a ISIS agent, ISIS a terrorist being operated in a hospital in Turkey. You actually have ISIS t-shirts available in parts of Turkey. It has become that ridiculous. And these guys travel in wearing ISIS t-shirts, they are traveling in Istanbul and Ankara. These are the Humvees. We will see another video on this. But these Humvees travel between Mosul in Iraq to Raqqa in Syria, across 800 kilometers of desert, open flatland, and the Americans don't know what's happening. It's ridiculous, actually. Okay? This is how ridiculous this entire operation. They, they supply these Toyota Humvees to them. You can see they're all the same make, same color. It's not some, you know, hotspot thing. They've been supplied thousands and thousands of these Humvees uh, to travel across Iraq and Syria. You actually have them having access to Scud missiles, to major advanced weapons, tanks. So the ISIS is not merely a terrorist organization, it's a terrorist army controlling a state. It has a capital in Raqqa, it has a capital in Mosul. This is what we are up against in this world. Things are changing on the ground, but the point is that how did they get hold of these weapons? They got, got hold, we are told, is when the Iraqi army retreated in Mosul and they could get their hands on these weapons. When they got their hands on these weapons, the Americans did not attack them, and that is standard operating procedure for the Americans, that if our weapons are going to go to the hands of the enemy, we should destroy them. And at the same time, America was droning Yemen, America was droning into Pakistan, Afghanistan, that is all routine, but no drones or no aerial attacks in Iraq to counter the ISIS. This is Lindsey Graham. He talks of the coming 9-11 attack. This is a kind of fear-mongering. This is a very Lindsey Graham who is in a photograph with Bell Hajj next to John McCain. So they meet terrorists, they create terror gangs, and then they warn people about the coming 9-11 attack. And why is he doing it? Why is he doing it? Basically, there is the Republican lobby uh, and even elements within the Democratic Party who wanted boots on the ground. And that is where we need to discuss in the refugee issue. Why is the refugee issue actually being created? Okay. So, the John McCain lobby linked to the Israelis, they basically wanted boots on the ground where American would form 10% of the boots on the ground, but then you would have Turkish troops and you would have troops from the Arab League. Now, how were they going to manage it? They were going to manage it in the same way that they managed Libya. And that is why you had, in 2013, the entire chemical weapons attack story in Gotha, in the suburb of Damascus. So, the Syrian government invites the United Nations 
delegation come to Syria, the day they land in Damascus, you have a chemical weapons attack in the suburbs of Damascus. Within half an hour, CNN, BBC, Al Jazeera, Assad has crossed the red line, now we must go and attack Syria. Now there's a remarkable lady in, in uh, Syria, her name is Mother Agnes Mariam of the Cross. She's a remarkable lady, she's a Lebanese Palestinian nun. She lives in Lebanon, but she, she went with a little team into this area in that war zone and she did a fact-finding report on that. You will not believe what was happening. The photographs of the children that we saw who had been victims of the chemical weapons attack were children who were kidnapped by the rebels. Because when they were shown on TV, Mother Agnes, who does a lot of work amongst the communities over there, she and her friends began to get calls that we can see our children over there and they've been kidnapped. So they began to track the families of these children. They were mainly Alawite children, by the way. But those children who were being kidnapped by the ISIS and the Al-Qaeda were then chemical weapons were being used on them. Those very photographs were being released to the world and an entire hysteria being that was created. Recently, one Turkish member of parliament has come out with the entire story where he said that the sarin chemical weapons gas has been supplied to the ISIS via Turkey through Turkish intelligence. Two important journalists, very senior journalists in Turkey who are behind bars for 45 years, they say, for actually revealing the role of Erdogan's government and Turkish intelligence in this entire sordid episode. So the agenda was that you shout chemical weapons, you go to the United States Security Council or not, you announce a no-fly zone, and then you send in the ISIS and Al-Qaeda that they did in Libya, but it failed. It failed because this report of Mother Agnes went to Sergei Lavrov in Russia. The Russians placed it in the United Nations Security Council, and they exposed the hand of the Saudis, the Qataris, and the Turks in this entire operation. Obama had to back out. And Putin gave him a respectful way, okay, you don't attack, you can't attack, we will get Assad to give all his chemical weapons up to the, uh, to the United Nations. That was what actually happened in 2013. And the refugee issue, what is the Turkish agenda? The Turkish agenda is actually to capture the northern territories of Syria that they can take. Everybody is out for a grab. The Israelis want to take over Golan. They've actually given out oil contracts to Dick Cheney's company to dig, uh, uh, to oil, drill oil in the, in the Golanites, which is actually Syrian territory. In the north, you have the Turks trying to capture uh, territory from Syria and even into Iraq. Turkey uh, recently sent an entire, you know, thousand soldiers into Mosul to fight ISIS when they're supporting ISIS. So everybody is supposedly fighting terror, but out for their own uh, land and uh, resource grabs also.